So I'm here with Jeannie Birch, who is the Neustorf Professor of Urban Research and co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. Thank you very much. So Jeannie, uh, you've been involved, I know, for a number of years with the future of places. And more than that, you've been involved with uh, UN Habitat and developing the new urban agenda. With You were chair of the World Urban Campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about your work, uh, both with UN Habitat and in the university? Well, I guess I'll start with the university. I've been at the university since 1998, where I was invited to come chair the Department of City and Regional Planning. And I did that for 10 years. Uh, and then uh, the university decided to start an institute focused on urban research. And I was asked to co-chair that with Susan Walker at the Wharton School. So we had business and design. I'm in the School of Design. Uh, working on this particular activity. The uh, Institute is now over 10 years old. We have a number of publications. We have a series at uh, Penn Press, uh, The City in the 21st Century. We do a good deal of research ourselves, obviously, and we view ourselves as a convener and a voice uh, with regard to urban research. So can you tell us about your role with the uh, World Urban Campaign and also uh, the, uh, the General Assembly of Partners. Maybe we'll talk about that separately. Tell well, us about the world they evolved. Uh, so about 2009, I was invited to come to a meeting. And uh, I think it was in Rio, in the, in the World Urban Forum in Rio, at which point the World Urban Campaign was being launched. And the idea was that this would be an arm of UN Habitat to help support with the advocacy of uh, the various activities that Habitat was involved with. Uh, fast forward now to 2014, and the preparations for Habitat 3 were beginning. Uh, we had a wonderful first Urban Thinkers campus at Caserta in uh, Italy. And at that campus, we formulated the ideas around the city we need as an advocacy, advocacy piece for UN Habitat and the World Urban Campaign. But we also realized there was a, the World Urban Campaign uh, needed to be broadened and redefined with regard to the engagement for Habitat 3. And that was the birth of the General Assembly of Partners. So it seems to me that this is a critical task that uh, all of us uh, have to somehow uh, face, which is how to build the partnerships, how to build the partners uh, in the, into a kind of effective network. And I know you've been thinking that way about the General Assembly of Partners, right? Certainly. Uh, what we did first was we realized that there were many groups that were had a stake in thinking about uh, what the new urban agenda, what would become the new urban agenda, uh, should contain. And uh, we identified those groups, and we had 14 groups. You may or may not know that the United Nations has an official nine major groups, and those emanated from the environmental conferences, and the nature of those groups are focused on environmental needs. Well, certainly cities have an environmental component, but they have other components at well, as well. So we um, added uh, a, another set of groups, six more groups, ultimate, well, seven today, uh, six more groups uh, uh, to uh, be part of this engagement platform. And the kinds of groups we added who hadn't been thought about in the environmental work were older persons, persons with disability, the media, parliamentarians, grassroots, and so forth. Um, the idea was to uh, create networks among those groups, but to create a multi-stakeholder platform where there would be discussions, inter-platform, intra platform discussions about issues around which we had consensus, yet at the same time leave those individual groups to advocate for their particular needs. And uh, the United Nations had never seen anything like this. When we announced this to the Bureau, which was the executive committee who was planning Habitat 3, the uh, members, I, literally, the eyes rolled. They said, oh, we don't think you can do that. And I mentioned I had been on the New York City Planning Commission, and I thought we could. <laughs> and so uh, we did. Uh, we uh, spent a, a good deal of time organizing and discussing among ourselves as to what we thought our role would be. And we focused on the idea of partnership and the kind of things that partnerships can bring and focused on four areas. The first area is knowledge, knowledge sharing and capacity building. 
The second area is piloti pi piloting innovative ideas. Uh, the third area is monitoring, contributing to the monitoring of what would emerge from the New Urban Agenda and also the associated Agenda 2030. Uh, and lastly, advocacy. We would never stop the advocacy. That was part of the, the MO of what partners can do. And so uh, as, we, as the pr preparations went forward uh, for Habitat 3, we had quite an active role. You may or may not know that contrary to other conferences around Habitat, the actual documents had been produced by the agency, managed by the member states, with very little input from the stakeholders. This time around, this, the formation of the preparation was such that there was a good deal more input. There were 11 regional and thematic conferences. There were the policy units, which were 200 experts that created material for them. And with regard to GAP, we were involved in the drafting committees of the conferences, and we were involved, uh, members were involved in the policy units. And then we were asked to do something along with the um, Global task, the Global Task Force, which is the local governments group, uh, both of our groups were asked to hold hearings, just like a, a city planning hearing. Uh, the draft uh, New Urban Agenda came out. Uh, the uh, Global Task Force went first. They assembled, I don't know how many mayors, 40 mayors on the floor of the General Assembly in the UN, right next to the member states, who uh, talked about what they thought was good or bad or needed to be rectified in the New Urban Agenda. Uh, the member states went back and negotiated, the next draft came out, and we at the General Assembly of Partners were invited to create a similar set of hearings and did the same thing again. So uh, this was fairly unusual. And then when it came to uh, Habitat 3, uh, each group, each stakeholder group, was asked to create stakeholder roundtables to discuss next steps. Uh, in terms of where implementation would go. And um, we were recognized for this work. We had an, um, uh, a meeting, a private meeting. I, I guess we shouldn't call it a private meeting. It was an open meeting, but basically it was a meeting with the Secretary General, who was very excited that we had all come together and worked on this project. Uh, so uh, now the job is to turn from being advocates. And let me tell you, some of our groups are pretty, pretty good at this advocacy. The, older persons, watch out for them. They started out with three references in the New Urban Agenda and ended up with something like 27. At any rate, now it's time, the rubber is hitting the road, and it's time to think about how to implement the New Urban Agenda, and so we're now moving towards in that direction. And the role of UN Habitat itself is changing, right? There's been an uh, advisory uh, group that's come in and evaluated UN Habitat's role and thought about uh, new structures like uh, UN cities and so on. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Certainly. Um, as the member states were negotiating the uh, new urban agenda, they quite frankly couldn't come to agreement as to exactly what this new role should be for UN Habitat. And so what they did was ask the Secretary General to appoint a panel of experts to do a study. And uh, they were appointed, I guess, in last spring, and they spent several months and came up with uh, a, a wonderful report of many recommendations about how to make UN Habitat what they called fit for purpose, uh, the purpose of implementing the new urban agenda. And uh, that uh, report was then brought to the General Assembly with the President of the General Assembly held a series of uh, panels to review the report. Uh, we were asked again as part of GAP to uh, comment on that. And um, then that, along with the report, was sent to what's called the Second Committee, which is the uh, committee that writes the resolutions, basically. And uh, they decided, and I think this was a very wise decision, to send some of the ideas back to Nairobi for more discussion because the UN system itself is undergoing uh, some reforms. And they thought it would be premature to come up with some suggestions for UN Habitat before the UN reforms had, had taken place. And so there's now a, a new schedule for thinking about how to uh, align uh, the, uh, what will be a new structure of some sort for UN Habitat with the um, initiatives that, are, uh, that the overall UN system will have. From the point of view of uh, stakeholders and partnerships, if one reads the Secretary General's report, the most recent one was in December, there's, there's a very strong, strong uh, suggest, set of suggestions on the role of partnerships and how to manage them, and is calling for a system-wide 
uh, organization of partnerships, which I think is a very good thing. And of course, you and Habitat's um, resources are going to be limited, so it, it seems that they really are going to need this network of partners that uh, you've been working on for so long. Well, I just finished a paper about the, uh, and it's on our website, the Penn IUR website, which traces the role of stakeholders and partnerships over time. And basically, there are a couple of points here. In 1946, when we the peoples, which is the first sentence of the Charter of the UN, was signed. There was a provision in there to bring for ECOSOC, which is the um, Economic and uh, Social Council that's meant to carry out the second mandate, which is to advance the social and economic uh, life of peoples. Um, there was a provision in that saying that experts could be brought in to help the uh, member states understand a about a particular issue or to reflect public opinion. But there's always been a very, very strong line about maintaining national sovereignty in the uh, decision-making powers of the United Nations. And that still pertains. But in the ensuing years, 70 years, big changes have, heard about, uh, have occurred as to how the UN has um, formulated its, its priorities. And I would say that one of the areas that's been extremely important in helping create a revolution in this has been the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Stockholm uh, uh, first uh, conference on the environment was held in Stockholm. And at that time, uh, the conference was member states. Uh, if they wanted to have an expert come in, they closed the official meeting. Barbara Ward was then invited to give, Barbara Ward, the economist who wrote The Home of Man, uh, the uh, Only One Earth, was invited to give an hour and a half lecture, but not part of the official proceedings. However, much to their surprise, 10,000 people showed up in uh, Stockholm and, and uh, started thinking, of, uh, got the member states thinking about how they might uh, start talking more systematically to the uh, stakeholders and partners. Fast forward, I mean, there's a, a many steps in this story, but fast forward to 2000, 2000, right after the MDGs were passed, when uh, Kofi Annan created a panel of eminent persons to study the relationships with civil society. And the headline of their study was basically, the engaging with civil society is not, is an, is, is a, not an option, it's a necessity. How the member states would define this necessity, however, has been uh, a little bit of a tug of war because there's always the national sovereignty piece, but the question is how much decision making or how much advice might occur. So what we're seeing now, um, obviously from 1947 to the present, is certainly uh, stakeholders and partners have played an enormous role in defining new areas. And for our area, which is that of spatial development of cities, I think you can attribute that to the Habitat Three conferences, Habitat conferences. The UN never would have paid any attention to spatial development, urban form, urban design, public space, without the push from the stakeholders who insisted that unless this attention was given, you would not achieve those social and economic activities. And that then gets expressed in goal 11 of the SDGs. Well, uh, it seems that we've come very far to this point after many years, and I know you've been working very hard on this. Uh, we have a long way to go, perhaps, uh, but we have a lot to work with, it seems, thanks to you and your, your work and the work of others. Uh, Jeannie Birch, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I want to thank you for your work and the work that you're doing in public space, because that is absolutely critical for the future of cities. Thank you. Thank you.